I'm not, I'm not making this up. This is a genuine response. Uh, I gave a little piece of paper, and I do small talks, so and I ask people to write it down. And, uh, but which doctors in the Amazon? And this really doesn't suggest a collection of plants that's really particularly easy to get hold of, or particularly something that's relevant today. It's kind of exotic. Uh, you'd see them on Tribe, on that Medicine Men Go Wild program. But you don't necessarily think about it as something that's necessarily useful and practical. Another one they come up with is Swiss Institutes. I think you, know, you think about those, those cosmetics adverts where everything is beautiful in chrome, and people have those white coats on, and they're creating all kinds of amazing Botox-like creams. Um, I, I think that's fascinating, because if, if you look at the marketing image of plant-based medicine, it's always dive off into the Amazon, go down there and find all these wonderful things. And once you've, once you've got hold of them, you need a specialist pharmaceutical lab to put them all together. And really, plant-based medicine couldn't be very much further from the truth. It's far more mundane, far more relevant, far more accessible than any of these really beautiful, you know, this makes great adverts, uh, but it isn't really very fair or true as a representative of plant medicine. Uh, the other one, which probably is quite a good representation in some sectors, definitely, is fads and big business, and it kind of comes from the first one. You know, you call kind of, uh, without mentioning any television names, your, your promotions of these amazing wonder drugs or superfoods that will cure everything and make you younger and thinner and like the celebrities you see in Heat Magazine. That's kind of also not a really fair representation. Um, there's this one, which is great. Unfortunately, I didn't want to be political, but I've tried to find an image of snake oil salesman, and the only one was George Bush. Um, I promise you. And snake oil salesman, I don't know if anyone knows what this means here. It's a very North American kind of expression, and it was brought up by one of the students on the master's uh, program from Canada. And um, snake oil salesman is basically a byword in America for a scam artist or a con man. Um, but interestingly, snake oil salesman actually comes out of real men who used to sell snake oil in the 1800s in America. Um, it first, so the, uh, the, the phenomenon first occurred in the western coast of the United States as uh, Chinese immigrants introduced Chinese traditional medicine, uh, in this case snake oil, to treat things like uh, arthritis and general uh, inflammatory conditions, things like muscle soreness and stiffness. Um, and it was really ridiculed and it was sold, you know, complete, complete rubbish that hocus pocus that were people that are trying to scam you out of your money. Um, very interestingly, modern research has shown that uh, snake oil, and particularly the variety and species of snake used in China, is actually very high in omega-3 and 6, and I think 9, I can't remember exactly, uh, fatty acids. And they work in similar ways when applied externally to modern anti-inflammatory. So there is a lot of evidence to suggest that although it sounds far-fetched, it could actually work. Um, and the other one is uh, one of my favorite ones, dreadlocks and muddy boots. Uh, I say in my series, I said it once, and my producer made me repeat it and cut it into everything, but I'm not a hippie. I don't mean that in the sense that there's anything negative about being a hippie, but I think that so much of plant-based medicine is getting wrapped up in lifestyle. This whole like, idea that you don't take your echinacea organic tincture because it's necessarily very good or very effective. It's just kind of the eco-natural thing to do. You know, we should all do eco-natural things because that's kind of a nice thing to do. I'm not really like that. I do stuff because I perceive or I feel it works. I don't do it because it's a lifestyle choice and I'm kind of in the cool crowd. Um, I've never been in the cool crowd. Uh, the, the last thing is conjunct concoctions. And I think all of these, these sort of descriptions that genuinely people have come up with um, in, in meetings and talks really kind of portray a very, very specific image that we have in the West of plant based medicine. And if this works, they suggest that it's a system of healthcare that's impractical, like you need to go off to the Amazon and you need your pharmaceutical institute. It's ineffective, you know, snake oil salesmen sell it. It's basically fads and big business. And because it's impractical and ineffective, why would you ever want to do it? It's completely irrelevant. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, so, but I would pass on this. I'm one of those very vain people on television that Googles themselves. Uh, and I found this on a, a bad science message work. Before the series came out, um, the, the production behind the scenes is very, very um, well researched and very well backed up in all senses, but we still attracted, before the series came out, not after, interestingly, some sort of speculative criticism, shall I say. And it's uh, this particular blog entry said, you know, this is going to be another one of those programs that's airy fairy and it's basically going to say support natural stuff even though it doesn't work. And they said a history of herbal medicine and why it is now obsolete would be fascinating. There are many pharmaceutical compounds that originate in plants but have been improved thanks to science. 
Um, that is quite a standard belief through large parts of the community. And what I think is really interesting is that a lot of people on the bad science message board actually portray bad science because that quote there is like a definition of thought that hopefully convinced you. Um, traditionally, this quote, all of those images pre previously, suggests that there's these, these two entirely separate entities. One is conventional medicine. It's synthetic, it's evidence-based, it's proven to be safe. And it comes in little pills and injections and kind of very foreign, difficult to relate to sort of, uh, sort of mechanisms. And the other one is herbal medicine, which is, it's natural, it's, a, it's ineffective, it's potentially dangerous, but it's kind of eco and nice. And we have a big black line in our minds that separates the drug from the plant-based medicine. And I know a lot of people that say, you know, James, I, I've got a really bad headache, but I just can't deal with uh, the fact, the idea of taking aspirin. I mean, I'm not into synthetic soaps. I want something natural. And exactly, aspirin is first isolated from natural sources, and you can actually get compounds that are very, very similar in nature. And um, that basically shows that this whole idea about the two things being completely separate ideas is really much more a cultural understanding than a scientific. There we are, cultural perception, not scientific fact. Um, I am going to go through this and hopefully convince you uh, around to my, my opinion. I think there are two big myths, uh, and they're in the first line there. One is that um, plant-based medicine is ineffective, and the other one is that it's impractical. I'm going to deal with ineffective first of all, because I think that's probably the biggest one that everyone would have heard of. Um, so people who think that uh, plant-based medicine is a relic and it's all mumbo jumbo and no one uses it and it's really consigned to the past, I'd say that 80% of the world's population relies on plant-based medicines as their primary form of healthcare. We're really the only society, modern Western society, that can A, afford it, and B, only believes in it and doesn't believe in other forms of healthcare. And I didn't make that up, that's, you know, World Health Organization stamp sealed approved figure. Um, the thing is, you could say, well, that's because 80% of the world's population is too poor to afford it. So at the end, they'll grind up some ineffective routes because they can't afford to buy aspirin. So I'll go on. 50% uh, of the most important conventional drugs are based on chemicals that were first isolated from natural sources. This is the stuff you get on the NHS. This is the stuff you buy in boots. If you flip around the labels of things like Listerine, You'll flip over and you'll, you'll see all the stuff in there. Uh, eugenol comes from cloves. It's what gives um, the, the smell of a dentist when you walk in there, that kind of spicy scent. It's antibacterial and it's also mildly anti-inflammatory and, and analgesic. Uh, things like aspirin, uh, penicillin, all originally come from natural sources. And that's, that's a pretty big percentage. Um, there we are, penicillin. Who would have ever thought it? There is a traditional practice that's been well documented since the Middle Ages. When you have a septic wound, you rub moldy bread on it. That has got to be the stereotype of weirdo, hippie medicine that obviously has no basis in science. Uh, that's where all our antibiotics come from, or a lot of our antibiotics come from. Penicillin, the mold that was discovered um, or was introduced to Western science about 70 years ago in the 30s or the late 20s, 30s. But this stuff has been going on since the Middle Ages. Other stuff, aspirin. Okay, I, I could take my pick on which plant I put in there because it's been isolated from willow bark, it's been isolated from meadow sweet. I put some meadow sweet on there. But it's salicylic acid, which is basically uh, the chemical that's very similar to aspirin and works in a similar way. It's first isolated from those. And morphine. Every time you pop a relatively hardcore painkiller, things like codeine, things like morphine, which is still very, very commonly used today, come from opium poppies. And, um, you can, you can synthesize some parts of it, but the opium is still grown on a huge industrial scale for the, for the pharmaceutical industries. But it's not just this old stuff either. I think, you know, we've all heard about maybe, you know, especially Eden, all of these things coming from plants. And it's quite happy to, you know, in the 60s there was this idea that a lot of our plant-based medicine, or a lot of our medicine was first based on plants, but now we're good enough scientists to make whatever chemical we want in the lab. You know, we know how all this stuff works. So if we want a different type of morphine that works in a different way, we can basically mess around with the chemicals and create a similar chemical that doesn't exist in nature, that does the job a lot better. Why do we need plants anymore? Well, they quite quickly came to the realization that, A, that's either possible, but it's not financially sort of viable, or B, sometimes 
plants work in such unusual and unexpected ways that you can't possibly sit down and create this chemical because it doesn't work in a predictable way. Um, a good example of that is Mahonia, which is a really common garden plant. It's the kind of thing you see in Sainsbury's car parks and in council roundabouts. It's on fire at the moment. Those kind of uh, holly-like leaves and kind of yellow, orange blossom scented flowers. It's been used to treat MRSA, uh, not only MRSA,